doesn't mean you can treat them like they're zoo animals and you're poking right. and tapping on the damn glass. Uh, bring it in leaves for a couple of weeks, consecutive holiday Mondays, one in the United States, one in Canada, kept us on the sideline. We go away and the sports world fall to, falls apart. You have uh, a 44 year old grandpa beating up on a YouTube star. You have Naomi Osaka withdrawing from uh, the French Open. And you have fans back in stands, and we've been begging for this. Ooh, bring back the fans. We miss the fans. We miss. We need the fans. We love the fans. And the fans are acting a damn fool. And so we're going to discuss all three of these, two of them more in detail than the third one, which I think we might already have given too much attention. But we are going to talk Osaka. We are going to talk uh, fan entitlement, fan misconduct, and what to do about it. And I don't do this by myself, obviously, here on Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. Uh, I do it with the best panel in the entire business. Joining me from Washington, D.C. with uh, Nipsey Hussle on the T-shirt and Black Lives Matter over her shoulder, Megan McPeak. How, how is it going, gentlemen? Good to see you again. I've missed you over the past couple of weeks. My Monday mornings are so boring. Like, there's just this big gap, <laughs> and I don't know what to do. Like, I guess I should have spent it <laughs> doing something productive, but I just sat there, like, uh, with, a, with a screenshot of the last episode on the iPad. You know, like that Wolverine meme, and he's looking at the picture? That was me. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us from Washington, D.C., uh, sports editor of The Nation, author of 10 books with an 11th on the way, The Kaepernick Effect. Now it's like there's physical copies of this book kind of circulating. Uh, Dave Zirin, how we doing? I'm doing well and over my shoulders. It's harder to see, but I've got Dr. John Carlos, 1968 Olympian, who just celebrated his 76th birthday. Happy birthday, John. And I've got some scrawled coaching notes from Greg Popovich that he threw away. And I asked if I could <laughs> take them and frame them. And he said, go, go to town, son. So... That's what I You're got. You're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. Good man. And listen, before we go any further, listen, guys, uh, it's great to have you back. Uh, audience, it's great to have you back. If you like what you're hearing, uh, hit like, hit subscribe, leave a comment. Um, all engagements matter. We're just here trying to feed the algorithm. And uh, so now let's get into to topic one, Naomi Osaka. Just before the French Open, she put out a statement saying she planned not to do any media at the French Open. And she had her reasons. One of them, she was more explicit about them later, but up front, she said, look, I I don't have the time, in the, in the, and I'm paraphrasing her, but I don't have the mental energy to deal with these post-match mo, post news conferences. And I don't feel like I should have to answer these questions that drain my confidence because, uh, Tennis fans know that Naomi Osaka does not play as well on clay as she plays on other surfaces. She says, I'm willing to pay the fine, uh, and I hope the organizers donate it to people who work with people struggling with mental health. So then the tournament comes, she plays her first match, uh, news conference time comes, she skips it, she gets fined, um, and it should end there, right? This is the rule book. You skip the news conference, you pay the fine. Naomi Osaka pays the fine because $15,000 is not a lot of money to her. It's not like it would be uh, to, to, to Dave or, or, or certainly to me, okay? $15,000 is a lot of money. It's not a lot of money to Naomi Osaka. She pays the fine. Uh, US Open, or the French Open doesn't say, okay, fine, let's call it even. They huddle with the, with the organizers of the other Grand Slam events and say, well, if you're not gonna skip, if you're not gonna do media, um, you're not playing any of these events. At which point Naomi Osaka says, well, I guess I'll withdraw from the French Open because I have been struggling with mental health for a long time. I've been struggling with depression. I've been struggling with anxiety. These situations trigger my depression and my anxiety. So it's better for me uh, to go on and do something else and step away from tennis and reset. Um, Megan McPeak, I understand that speaking to the media is part of the job, but if you're the organizer of the French Open, US Open, Wimbledon, don't you think that playing tennis is a bigger part of the job? And job one is to make sure your most famous, and unlike Logan Paul, most famous and most accomplished athletes are on the field. I mean, why are they coming down so hard on Naomi Osaka on, on an issue with they, with, that they could really have just worked out between the two camps? It makes you wonder if a player who was not the same tone mm -hmm. as in skin tone as Naomi Osaka decided to say the same thing if the repercussions would have been the exact same as Naomi Osaka has now experienced if the backlash at least from the uh, organizers would be similar 
And all we can do is speculate because it is definite that when it comes to tournaments, we see players who are of a darker skin tone be treated differently by judges, i.e. Serena Williams and the infamous, uh, I believe it was the cartoon that was drawn of her throwing a temper tantrum after, if I'm not mistaken and correct me if I am, uh, wrong, the U.S. Open when she faced Naomi Osaka. And that was the first time we kind of got to really and truly see Naomi Osaka on the big stage. And that's kind of also the first time that we began to hear Naomi Osaka speak about mental health and her mental health. And it makes me truly wonder, had Naomi, quite frankly, been white, would they have treated her the same way? Would they have doubled down after her first match following missing the media as she quite blatantly told them they were that she was going to do. She put it on Front Street from the beginning. I'm not going to do media. I'm happy to take the fine to your mm-hmm. point, Morgan. When she did that, it should have ended there and she could have continued playing and continued missing media and continued paying the fine. It should have ended there. But I truly do wonder if she was white, would it have been the same treatment? And a, a credit, huge credit goes to not only the Calm app, but as well to other sponsors that she has and the tennis athletes, both male and female, for supporting her and truly truly athletes around the world for supporting her and standing with her in this moment because it took a lot of courage for her to admit to us what was going on from the beginning. It took a lot of courage for her to put this out there ahead of the match. And it took a lot of courage for her with her sponsors and her Uh, endorsements to say, I'm going to accept these fines and I'm not going to speak to the media. So I respect her for for protecting her mental health and her peace. And I think the tennis world as a whole, from the organizational standpoint, needs to truly look themselves in the mirror and see if the rules that they have now from decades ago are still valid and relevant to today's tennis athletes. Mm Absolutely. And I wonder if Naomi Osaka is going to get a rebate from her agent because in the real world, it should not fall to the athlete to have to craft these state statements for herself or himself in a situation like this. What am I paying the agent for except other than to act on my behalf? And if, and if I'm having um, a problem with my mental health, with my physical health, and I don't feel like dealing with the media, it shouldn't fall to me to bang out a bunch of uh, Instagram statements and put it out there and let it stand and then let people uh, pillory me if they don't like what I've said. Like this isn't a situation where an agent or a representative needs to step up and say, hey, here's what the situation is. And if we, if, like the, the, the one thing the last four years is supposed to have taught us, um, well, and we should have learned this nine years ago, uh, going back to, to today's buddy, uh, Royce White, you know, when he was very open with his struggles about, with depression and anxiety. Um, and he laid it out, he didn't hide it. And one of the reasons he butted heads with the NBA was that the NBA didn't want to see these conditions as like actual uh, physical, con- actual conditions on, on par with physical conditions. And so when Royce White does it, does, does it, he's a little bit ahead of his time, but if certainly since 2017, this is how the, the language and the talk around sports have, have changed. And we have allegedly uh, gotten to the point where we treat mental illness, mental health, like physical health. So if somebody says my knee is full of fluid and I got to drain my fluid after every match, I might not be able to play this whole tournament. You might say, okay, or you might, as a lot of sports fans say, we'll go out there till your knee falls off. And then when your knee falls off, we'll, we, will, we will decide that you have played hard enough. But if Naomi Osaka says, hey, look, uh, my mental health is less than optimum right now, then we as fans, as media, as organizers have to accept that the same way she, the same way we would if she said her Achilles tendon was hanging by a thread. Yet that's not how she was treated. Dave Zyron, how does any of this make sense? Morgan, Morgan, it makes sense if you understand that this is not about mental health and it's not mm-hmm. about the media. Uh, the tennis world, Megan mentioned them looking in themselves in the mirror and asking themselves some questions. They're not asking themselves questions. They're saying mission accomplished. This isn't about mental health. This isn't about media. This is about the reestablishment of hierarchy. You know, then I think you can connect what happened with Naomi Osaka with, with, with the fan behavior in NBA games. We have to look at this contextually. In 2020, you saw an upsurge of athletes using their platform like nothing we've seen since the 1960s and perhaps even more than the 1960s. You saw athletes speaking out on questions of racialized police violence, on the elections, and on mental health. 
You saw all of this in 2020, and the minders of sports said, all right, take the platform, take the stage, speak out, do your thing, because basically you're keeping the lights on. You're playing sports in the context <laughs> of a global deadly pandemic, and right. you're allowing us to televise thing and get our money. So please, by all means, use the platform. We'll put Black Lives Matter on the court. We'll put end racism in the end zone, and we'll allow, because that's how they view it, Naomi Osaka to wear face masks that have the names of people killed by police, men and women, on the court at the U.S. Open. And now they are letting the world know that we're getting back to business. We are putting the wine back in the bottle. We're going to stop alienating largely white fans, and we're going to start putting out a product that's going to appeal to everybody. And the way we're going to make this clear to the public is through discipline and the reestablishment of hierarchy. And I think what they were doing to Naomi Osaka was sending a message. Look at what they did. They produced a letter. Signed, what, what do the other Grand Slams have to do with what's happening in the French Open? Why does yes. Wimbledon, Australia, the US Open, why do they have anything to say about this? They should have nothing to say about this. Yet they all signed this letter saying to the number two player in the world and arguably the most popular player on the tour right now, you're not gonna play unless you play by our rules. The whole thing is so outrageous. It's like it's like trying to take out a church mouse with a rocket launcher is what they <laughs> did. And so there's no way for me to analyze this without understanding it as a 2021 issue, as a reaction to 2020 and the reestablishment of hierarchy. Not just play by our rules, Dave, but play by these new rules that we make up as we go along. Because Naomi Osaka already said, I'm happy to play by your rules. It was like uh, that story that might be apocryphal about Jack Johnson getting pulled over for, uh, for speeding in that town in Georgia. And the officer says it's a $50 fine and Jack Johnson hands him $100. And he says, I'll be going back. I'll be going just as fast when I come back through town. So Naomi Osaka says, listen, I'm 15 grand. Cool. I got it. And that was the rule. She played by the rule. And now these guys came up with a new rule. And I don't know why, and again, one of the overarching themes of all of these conversations is that regardless of how good a player is, that person's profile moves the needle. But in Naomi Osaka, Dave, as you said, you have somebody who is the highest profile player in the sport right now and number two in the world. Like there is no reason not to have this person on the court. So if you feel like um, uh, dealing with the media is a, is a part of these people's job, Okay, then it is. But the biggest part of their job is to prepare, to perform, and to pass the drug test. Those are the three biggest parts of the job. And like dealing with the media only matters insofar as they're doing the other things. So if Naomi Osaka just said, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not playing, but I'm gonna do every news conference, would they would they then have been happy? No, they wouldn't have, because then you wouldn't have the best tournament in the world. You'd have the second best tournament in the world, the third best. Uh, Dave, you were gonna say something. It's just that um, you know, the media of which I'm a part, you know, I did a bunch of radio, some television about this. It's amazing how much the media missed this story and made it about themselves. Yes. And not about the reaction of the tournament to Naomi Osaka. It's like the way Hollywood loves nominating for Oscars movies about Hollywood and movie making. <laughs> it's this incredible egocentrism that says, well, this must be about us when it wasn't about the media at all. It was about mental health, the reestablishment of hierarchy, and these tournaments going absolutely ham on Naomi Osaka when there was no reason to. Also, Go ahead, Megan. Also too, when you think of this, it makes you wonder, like, I understand both as a former athlete and as well too now part of the media, we have a job to do on both sides. I get that. That is unequivocally the obvious here but to dave's point the media missed the mark on this we as a whole missed the mark on this because the story should not have been naomi osaka you know avoiding the media it should have been the reaction to dave's point again of the tennis organizers and again <laughs> dave's right why did the why why did the australian open why did why did wimbledon why did they get in on this when it wasn't their tournament she played in their tournament and and did what was expected of her they should have kept their mouth shut but it makes you wonder when it comes to the media why can't two things be correct at the same time because <laughs> they can she could have easily gone into the media presser and said you know what guys i appreciate the job that you do in telling athlete stories but today my mental health is not well i need to just protect myself out of respect, I'd like you to please respect that. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna step away from doing media today. Had she said that, would would 
the French Open been okay with that? Because they probably would have made an even bigger deal if she was honest in the press conference and walked away. But guess what? The media also has an obligation, and me again, being part of the media, we have an obligation to tell these stories, whether the athletes give us the access or not. If her story is that her mental health is not well because she does not want to deal and, and doesn't feel that her confidence will be good enough to put the best product of her as a solo tennis player on the clay courts because she has not had good success on the clay courts, then we as the media have to stop digging in on that part of the story because you can only ask that question so many times to try and get a different answer. Unfortunately, it's just not her style of play. Why do we have to drive it home with the same athlete and continue to ask her, why can't you play well on the play courts? <laughs> what do you need to do differently? Do we not think that she's not trying to figure this out with her coaching staff? Well, and um, imagine two sports writers, especially daily sports writers on the beat, undergoing the same scrutiny. Like every time you wrote a story, here comes Naomi Osaka. Like, yo, Morgan, another anecdotal lead? Really? Why'd you do that again? Why didn't you move this quote up in the story? That would drive us nuts. And the other, um, the other kind of dilemma that we in the mainstream sports media are up against is we want to be able to tell these stories and talk honestly about mental health, but we also want all this stuff immediately and those two things do not go together real quick before we move on to the next topic like i remember in 2009 when edwin encarnacion first came to the blue jays and he played third base and he was not a good third baseman like he would boot balls they batted to him he would throw balls into the stands uh from across the from, like trying to throw to first base um and he also was not hitting very well and then over the 2010 2011 seasons they start moving the first base dh and he starts hitting better um, but like in 2009, if I had walked up and I, and he, and his English was not good. Like I could talk to him a little bit in Spanish, but he was not going to talk about that stuff back then. Uh, I caught up with him in 2017 when he was playing in, in Cleveland and putting up big numbers. And at that point, eight years later, I was able to ask him about 2009 and he was able to talk to me about all the anxiety and the stress he felt coming to the ballpark every day under all this pressure because he was scared he was going to make errors and it dragged on his offensive performance. But that was eight years later. He wasn't going to talk to me um, in that level of detail in real time, but we want Naomi Osaka to talk in real time about her mental health as if she's talking eight years from now and it doesn't work. Um, and so the other thing, as Dave mentioned, that we're up against is that the fans are finally back in the stadiums. Hey, the fans are back in the stadiums. The fans are cheering. Some fans are sitting in a social distance. Uh, fans that are vaccinated are crammed in like sardines. And uh, some of these fans have lost their minds. We had a guy throw a bottle at Kyrie Irving. We had somebody spit on Trey Young. We had somebody throw popcorn at Russell Westbrook. We had racist fans taunting John Morant and his family in Utah. So my question to you, Megan McPeak, is I understand that ticket revenue matters, but is ticket revenue valuable enough to justify what we're seeing right now? I think that's a loaded question. And... I load all my I, questions. I load, I load them all up. <laughs> Front loaded I know, questions. No, I know. And, and you know what? I'm going to take a page from Scott Brooks's book because I thought what he had to say after the incident uh, here in Washington, D.C. with the fan that managed to run through the lower bowl and onto yes. the court. And a huge shout out to the security guard who had one of the cleanest and most uh, form perfection tackles that we have probably <laughs> seen in a long time uh, here in Washington, D.C. If you're a Washington football fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You guys about. have not seen that since, <laughs> since, since the late Sean Taylor. Man. But he, he, he had a great point, and it makes you wonder, are these you know, lifetime bans or longtime bans, uh, having your tickets taken away, is that good enough? because fans continue to do it. In the span of not even two weeks, we saw, what, five different incidents? Mm -hmm. And it makes you wonder, when you look at the fan with the Kyrie Irving situation and the fan in DC, both have now subsequently had charges pressed against mm -hmm. them. Is that what it's going to take for fans? For and, and let's be clear too, let's make this very, very clear. Not all fans are like this because clearly we've had thousands of other fans in attendance at these same games who have been very respectful and not acted out in these ways. And even in the Kyrie Irving situation, fans were pointing out who it was. 
the mm -hmm. Russell Westbrook popcorn situation. Fans were pointing out who it was. So other fans around them are starting to realize that your ignorant and asinine behavior is going to reflect back on the rest of us and also mm -hmm. potentially have repercussions for the rest of us. Because what if the NBA says, you know what, there's too many incidents, we're, we're removing fans. Or what if they say, you know what, next season we're pushing fans back. You can't be in the lower bowl. Mm -hmm. It makes you wonder as another fan, okay, you know what? I don't want your your actions to reflect back on me because I had nothing to do with this. So I think Scott, what Scott Brooks said was, what what other you know avenues can we take? Are charges the right way to go? Because maybe that's the only way these fans get it through their mind that you can't act like this. Just mm -hmm. because you pay money to see these athletes play doesn't mean you can treat them like they're zoo animals and you're poking right. and tapping on the damn glass. You can't do that. You have to respect them as much as you want the respect back as a paying customer. Just because you're paying to see them uh, perform and do their job does not mean you can treat them like less than a human. I have some thoughts. I'm going to hold on and hold on to them for right now. Dave Zirin, why are people like this? Uh, people are like this for a lot of reasons. I mean, one reason is that people have been cooped up and being told for the last year that, oh, you're the special sauce. You're the missing ingredient in sports. We can't wait for you to come back. And fans in our social media age, they want to be part of the show by any means necessary, mm -hmm. even if that means doing something terribly destructive. That's one reason. The second reason is what I was talking about earlier. This is about the reestablishment of hierarchy. When you think of all the things that NBA and WNBA players did in the bubble in terms of social justice, sometimes I wonder how much of that actually would have gotten done if there had been fans in attendance, mm -hmm. booing for taking a knee, booing for uh, wearing the shirts, all that stuff. And now that the fans are back, some fans, and I don't, I, I really want to underline what Megan said, we shouldn't make this about all fans, whatever, but it only takes a couple, only takes a minority of knuckleheads uh, to ruin this for everybody. It really does. And we've seen this in European soccer. We've seen this where uh, racist fans have made it so teams get penalized, where stands have to be emptied and all the rest of it. I think you were asking about solutions. I think you know the, the first step is going to have to be finding teams if there are fan incidents, which then puts pressure on management and ownership to make sure there is enough security to make sure that these things either get taken care of or there is a presence that says no. So it puts it on the team to make sure that there's a safe environment for the players. That's going to have to be step one. And I hope there are more steps before we go the European soccer route because that is a very, very dystopian place to be. Yeah, Dave, when I see these incidents, like what the perpetrators remind me of, like if we could draw a Venn diagram, I'm sure there's a lot of overlap between the people trying to spit on Trey Young and trying to throw water bottles at uh, Kyrie Irving. There's a big overlap between that group and the uh, I have my rights, don't make me wear a mask. I have a right to uh, sit in this restaurant and berate the wait staff during a pandemic group. Uh, those are a lot of the same people, people that feel like whoever uh, they have come to watch work owes them something and, and owes owes it to them. Customer, I'm the customer. I'm, I'm always right. It's within a set of rules you are, but not really. You're not right when you throw a water bottle at a person. Um, and so I, a lot of uh, the pandemic has just uh, enabled the worst in a lot of people and it has enabled a lot of the worst people to go out here and treat people as poorly as they have always wanted to treat people, uh, but do it under the guise of rights, do it under the guise of, uh, I'm just um, a really dedicated fan with a lot of pent up uh, passion. And so I had to try to injure Kyrie Irving. Now, in terms of solutions, uh, like in real life, I'm not a law, law and order guy, you know, I'd rather prevent crime than have to try to punish it punish it on the back. But in, in, in situations like this where the transgression is like completely discretionary and completely uh, at the transgressor's convenience, I am all for like disproportionate deterrent punishment. Like this guy in Boston that threw the water bottle at uh, Kyrie Irving, he's being charged with a felony. The prosecutor says we have to send a message. So now it, if like the person that, 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 that shoots someone, that kills someone, you're not in a headspace where you're thinking about consequences. 
right? So there might be a death penalty. States where there's the death penalty, people still get shot. Um, but throwing a water bottle, you know what the consequences are. If you think if you think throwing this water bottle is worth worth risking prison, buddy, go ahead. And you can also like put this stuff in the fine print of the tickets or the electronic tickets. You know, the teams are increasingly selling, which makes it hard. It should make it harder for people to do this stuff because now you're not just a person walking with a piece of paper. If you scan your ticket, like the team knows exactly who you are when you walk in the stadium. They know where you're sitting. So it's a lot easier for them to pinpoint where this projectile came from and who might have uh, thrown it. So if I'm all four teams, you know, revoking tickets, teams finding teams finding uh, the, the the perpetrators. Say, hey, if you throw something on the court, that's going to cost you $20,000. Put it in the fine print of the ticket. Terms and conditions. Read the terms and conditions. Like, is that disproportionate? Yes. Will it stop idiots from doing this stuff? Absolutely. D Dave, were you going to say something else? Megan. No, I was actually, re remember when uh, there was the incident with the Utah Jazz fan and Russell Westbrook when he was then with OKC? They, yes. those, those two, uh, humans, because I can't think of a more appropriate <laughs> word to use, uh, actually had the uh, audacity, if you will, to file a hundred million dollar lawsuit against Russell Westbrook. And the timing, which is very interesting, of this now thrown out and dismissed lawsuit by the judge was interesting because it came off of the heels of the popcorn incident with Russell mm -hmm. Westbrook. After that, ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski reported that the judge in the case had dismissed the lawsuit by the two people who were involved in that altercation because they were trying to uh, file a lawsuit and sue Russell Westbrook for defamation on their character after that altercation because of the statements that were put out by the Utah Jazz and uh, Russell Westbrook and OKC at the time because they felt that he defamed their character and who they were as a person based on the altercation. But a judge disagreed. I think in situations like that, that's another uh, another tick for the athletes in their favor because that's showing that a judge did their due diligence and realized that these fans actually crossed the line and there is no basis for their lawsuit. So I think we may see more and more situations like this because to your point, Morgan, had that bottle hit Kyrie Irving in the eye, and did any damage to the point where he could not do his job. Mm -hmm. It's the NBA playoffs that would affect not only him as a potential player and his career moving forward, it could affect the Brooklyn Nets and their chase for a, a championship. And who knows if Kyrie Irving could have continued his playing career. He would have had grounds for charges of assault in that situation had that bottle made contact or caused any damage to him. Right. And that's oh, and what these fans need to realize is that you might think that you're getting your 15 minutes for doing something this asinine, but there are bigger repercussions that could come along with these incidents. And I need people to understand that that's what you're facing right now. And that's why these incidents can't continue to happen. Yeah, I just throw one more. Yeah, thing. go ahead, Dave. Is yeah. I spoke to some NBA players in the aftermath of these incidents and it's worth pointing out that not all fan bases are created equal or created ugly. Like the <laughs> problems in Utah and the problems in Boston are longstanding and very mm. real. And I think that needs to be called out as well. It like, I mean, it's fine to talk in broadly about problems with fans and I, and I'm fine with that approach, but I also think from Adam Silver on down, there needs to be something targeted that says, Utah, get your bleep together, Boston, get your bleep together. Or there will be specific penalties, maybe even mm -hmm. draft picks, you know, take away your second round picks, but put it on the organization and put it on these specific problem fan bases that they need to correct or their friend, their beloved franchises will pay the price. Well said, Dave. All right, so we're rounding the 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 the, the last corner, uh, head into the home stretch, in or out. This is a this is my favorite part of the of my favorite part of the week, where we um, tee up the topics and the panel knocks them down. Dave Zaron, I'm going to you first. Jacob Degrom of the Mets. He has reinvented himself as a pitcher. His ERA. We're at like a third of the way, almost halfway through the season. His ERA is 0.62. This is a starting pitcher, uh, and at the at the same time. 
the league wide batting average uh, is below 240. Last time I looked, the league wide batting average was 236, which was which, and it hasn't been that low in more than 50 years. Which also is perspective for how well like Vlad Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is right now. Like when you are 10 percent better than the best athletes, you know, best baseball players in the world, you're doing something. My question to you, Dave, are you in or out? on moving the pitching rubber back by a foot or so uh, to give the hitters a chance. I'm very out on that, just like I'm out on putting runners on second base in extra innings. What I'm in on is making sure that the sleet, sludge, snow, and slime that these baseball pitchers are using on the ball <laughs> start getting actually penalized and checked on a more regular basis. It's being called the greatest epidemic since the steroid era in the 90s in, in terms of distorting the balance of the game. There is just too much cheating coming down from the pitcher's mound. And if baseball started enforcing and suspending and going after these pitchers the way they've, they've been going after steroid offenders, then you're gonna start seeing these numbers get a little better and the game get a lot more entertaining than it currently is. Because currently, okay. I'm getting flashbacks to my kid playing Little League, where it's just like, strike out, strike out, walk, walk, <laughs> while the third baseman <laughs> takes a nap. Oh, my goodness. Well, I am, I'm in on moving the rubber back, just like, you know, in 1968, if you would ask people, are they in on lowering the mound? They'd have been like, no, it's been, the mound's been 15 inches since uh, Walter Johnson. If it's good enough for Christy Mathewson, it's good enough for me. You know, well, the times change, athletes change, and sometimes the dimensions of the field need to change. So I wouldn't mind moving the pitching rubber back. Like if people are, if, if the average fastball velocity is going up and every team has a bunch of guys that throw a hundred, um, that changes. Uh, a lot so the game has already changed so if you want to restore something like normalcy uh i don't know that it's out of order to move it back to 61 feet 61 six something like that megan mcpeak you in or out on making these types of changes i am in on figuring out what the best situation is i mean they already made the decision that they wanted to change the baseball and that's worked in favor of pitchers because we're seeing less home runs and less and and not as many big hits than we've seen in the past so if they're willing to do that but they're not willing to dave's point to come down on the new version of the steroid era when it comes to the uh substances they're putting on the baseball then we've got to figure out something because like dave i don't want to see little league in the major leagues when you're making 100 million dollar contracts <laughs> it's, it's amazing how like the the like the beginners and the elites just form this perfect circle because and the other reason that baseball looks like this a lot of the, a lot of the time is because the analytics folks have decided like this is the most efficient way to play and that the analytics folks have decided there's no shame in a strikeout and so players if the ball is coming uh, 102 all the time I'm not trying to uh, slap it to right field because and, and the, the parks are small. I'm not trying to slap it to right field and get a double and a triple. I'm just going to sell out. If I strike out, I strike out. If I make contact, uh, I'm going to have a high exit velocity and I'll get a home run. And these are your two true outcomes. And that's that. And it turns into something boring by design instead of boring by default. Uh, you know who's not boring? Shelly Ann Frazier. Uh, 10.63 in Jamaica on Saturday. And uh, I guess Trayvon Bramell, he woke up, he saw that on on, on uh, social media and he said, hold my sports drink. And he went out and he ran 9.77 in Florida. So 10.63 from Shelly Ann Price, second fastest all time in the women's 100 meters. 9.77 is seventh fastest all time for Bramell, but he is the second fastest runner um, to have, he's the second fastest person never to have had any type of drug suspension. So everyone between him and Usain Bolt, they've either got popped for like steroid steroids or they've missed tests like Christian Coleman or they've got, gotten popped for like uh, stimulants. Um, so my question to you, Megan, are you in or out on either of these two? If we're lucky enough to have a Tokyo Olympics, are you in or out on either of those two going even faster? I am so in on this because it means that we will get the best of the best in Tokyo running <laughs> for gold and I am always in on new records being set and shattered. So yes, I am in on faster in Tokyo. <laughs> Perfect, Dave, you in or out on either of these two running even faster in Tokyo? And I'm in on the bigger news of the track weekend that Tiffany Haddish is gonna be playing Flojo. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm in on. I, I, think, I think you're missing the big story, Morgan. 
Is she going to use like a sports scene double? No, like, from what I hear, the training is real. That's the oh, word on the street. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Look, man. I love that. <laughs> you guys love it, but like me Morgan. as someone who, who lives in a track and field household, again, like, and I'm so used to seeing like that really educated movement. And when I see people that like took up track and field three weeks ago and trying to act like they are like they're black belts in track and field, ugh, it, it's like it's like nails on the chalkboard. Um, Morgan, I am at the very, least, Morgan. At the very least, at least she's trying to put in the correct work. Give her yes. credit for that. She's at least trying. I will give her credit. I will give her credit. I will give her credit. But like get a get an action scene double. There's you know how many sprinters would 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 love to get that paycheck, man. It's hard making money in track and field. Your wife's am... available, right? <laughs> <laughs> She's actually running right now. There's a trail across the street. I'm gonna see if I can see her. Um, I am I'm out on Shelly Ann Price running faster later this year only because she's 33 or 34. And like, man, when you run a PB at 34, often that's your PB. Like I'm in on Trayvon Brumell running faster because he's 26. So just if, if you just use these rules of thumb, the 33 year old is the 33 year old still going to get that much faster. Uh, likely not. Can a 26 year old still get that much faster? Sure. But I'm looking and, to Megan's point, I'm just glad everybody's back healthy and showing what they can do um, when they're when they're healthy and prepared. Last one, guys. Are you? I'll start with you, Dave. Are you in or out on seeing either Logan Paul or Floyd Mayweather in a boxing ring ever again? Oh, I'm I'm in on it for the the worst reason. I mean, <laughs> it's. I'm just a huge boxing fan going back to, I mean, I was raised on the sport and the sport has been suffering for some time and anything that brings people closer to the idea of, I want to see some better approximation of this, I think will be good in the aggregate, even though I'm repulsed by the spectacle. <laughs> repulsed is a good word. Meg McPeak, you in or out? I'm in only if they actually implement correct and real and true to the game and the sport boxing rules let's see what logan paul can actually do put your money where your mouth is sir he knows he can't do anything and that's why i want real rules put he your money where your mouth is sir. let's get that knockout dave wants put your money where your mouth is he's gonna fight uh other youtubers or he's gonna fight uh uh a five foot eight grandpa and that's it he's not gonna he's not gonna get out here and fight fight a world-class cruiserweight you like most people listening have never heard of Junior Dorticos, but I promise you, Junior Dorticos, cruiserweight champion, would knock Logan Paul not even to next week, but several weeks in advance. So he knows this. So I'm all the way out on seeing Logan Paul box again. Like I'm not Mr. Novelty Fight. I'm sure that I know there's a big audience for that, but people tune into novelty fights and the novelty fights are boring, and then they get mad that the novelty fights are boring as if they didn't ex as if they didn't realize that a non-boxer and a grandpa are going to put together a dud of a fight. I'm all in on seeing Mayweather in the ring as a promoter. Uh, his big protege, Gervonta Tank Davis, has a fight coming up in a couple weeks. So if Mayweather's in the ring, like in sunglasses and a suit, patting a guy on the back saying, well done, uh, checks in the mail. Perfect. Mm. I'm in on that. I'm also in on uh, these weekly meetings, Monday mornings, my favorite time of the week, my favorite 40-ish minutes of every week. Uh, glad you guys as an audience could join us. Um, we will be back next week, we hope, because I don't see any um, holiday weekends on the horizon. Megan McPeak, between now and then, if the people start to miss you, where can they find you? On Twitter, as always, at Megan McPeak, spelled with an H, because it's the correct way to do it. Mm. Perfect. Dave Zirin, if the people start to miss you between now and next week, where can they find you? Just put a spotlight to the sky with a big bat on it, and I'll be there in a hurry. <laughs> Perfect. Guys, he's also at Edge of Sports on, on Twitter and on Instagram. As for me, I'm at Morgan P. Campbell on Twitter, at Morgan P. Campbell on Instagram. I keep telling you guys I'm too old for TikTok, too young for Triller, but you guys can find us back here every week. In the meantime, if you liked what you heard, like, comment, uh, subscribe to CBC Sports' YouTube channel. Uh, Subscribe to our, our Bring It In playlist, binge watch. Um, if you didn't like it, hit this like, comment anyway, feed the algorithm. It's what we like. Um, and until next week, this has been Morgan. Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. I'm your host, Morgan Campbell, and we will see you guys around. <laughs>